Michelle, you did great for a while. Things were looking really wonderful. I saw you for a few surveillance visits, mm -hmm. and I felt like you were getting your energy back, which was good. Then a year later, it's 2015, um, and you had a documented recurrence based on mm -hmm. imaging, and your CA125 started to creep up. At that point, we had a conversation about what the next steps are. But I think we had also discussed before when you complete a treatment, the high recurrence risks. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. patients with ovarian cancer, the relapse rate is about 70%. That's pretty high. I always have a hard time at the end of treatment mm -hmm. for that first line having that discussion because you want to be really honest about the high relapse rate, but you also want to instill hope that An maybe it might be you. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. um, do you, how did you feel at that moment? Devastating. It's devastating when you hear that your cancer is back. But there's no cure for it. So, you know, it's, it's to be expected. Um, so soon? No, I wasn't expecting it to come back so soon. But I wasn't either because you were BRCA1 positive. Yeah. Like yeah, you explained that to me mm -hmm. how when you have the BRCA1 positive, it actually helps your cancer. Mm -hmm. it, does, yeah. it does help your cancer, and, and it doesn't make sense. That's the huge paradox, yeah. right? It increases the risk of someone having cancer, but at the same time, it makes the cancer more susceptible to the chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And that goes into the science about what BRCA1 and BRCA2 proteins do, and they're involved in DNA repair. They're mm -hmm. involved in a specific type of DNA repair that's the most efficient one. And there's all these different pathways to repair DNA. So, fascinating. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it is very fascinating. But the whole it doesn't make sense thing mm -mm. is, it totally makes sense that it doesn't make sense. Do you make in a sense weird to way. me? It doesn't make sense, but I trust you anyway. So right. I'll trust you on that. It's a really weird phenomenon. So at the time that you had recurrence, we talked about different treatment options then. I don't know if you remember. I do. There, there was a couple um, clinical trials. So we, we're really fortunate at our practice that we have so many clinical trials that we can offer patients. In your situation, we chose um, to do treatment off of a clinical trial. And we talked about different chemotherapy options and adding back in the bevacizumab. Mm -hmm. At that point, um, there had been some information about bevacizumab improving disease control if you added it back with the chemotherapy and then you did what's called maintenance bevacizumab. Mm -hmm. And then there was also um, just recently um, there was a study that was published, GOG 213, about adding back bevacizumab not only improved disease control but also helped improve overall survival. Mm -hmm. And we discussed that a little bit and I think it's, a, it's about a five to six month improvement in overall survival. So in your situation, we're like, yes, we'll think you're going to respond to these drugs again because you did so well mm -hmm. the first time around. We're going to add the bevacizumab in again because you really did quite well with that and didn't have a lot of side effects. No, I really didn't. So it was mm -hmm. a nice time for me on and treatment the, then. And the other thing, too, that I talked to people about is, well, if you're going to start chemo again, there's three different backbones you can use. And I don't know if you remember this conversation. A but little bit, yeah. It's paclitaxel, carboplatinum, carboplatinum. gemcitabeam, yep. carboplatinum, and liposomal doxorubicin, and carboplatinum. And they're all given on different sequencing um, schedules or different administration schedules, and they have different side effects. Mm -hmm. And so that's another area that's really important to have that conversation with the physician, again, that's taking care of you, because the treatment decision that you ultimately go with really depends on patient characteristics and side effects from their past treatment. You had not had too many side effects from your no, prior treatment. No, I had abdominal cramping and some nauseous mm -hmm. moments. What about peripheral neuropathy? Because that's a big one for a lot of people. That's a numbness and tingling in your fingers. A little bit in my feet, but no. Mm -mm. And of course the bloat, I'm still dealing with the bloat and the fatigue. Mm -hmm. Fatigue mm -hmm. is another big thing that I'm dealing with right now from mm -hmm. treatments. Right, you've had that with. Yeah, and chemo brain. Course. Chemo brain is a fascinating. Fuzzy brain, yeah. That's a fascinating issue and it's real. I, I didn't really think it was, but I'm experiencing this. <laughs> I don't know if it's old age or if it's chemo brain, but I think it's a combination of both probably. I th it's a combination of both. I think you're absolutely right. But I think that the chemotherapy certainly accelerates the process. And they've done studies now where there's objective findings showing that in terms of having people do these scoring tests and saying mm -hmm. that, yeah, your brain doesn't work as well after chemotherapy. So you're not alone and everything you're feeling is real. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good, that makes me feel better. So, but um, one of the things I wanna get back to is peripheral neuropathy. So you were really lucky you didn't have that horribly. About 20% of patients will have this residual peripheral neuropathy mm -hmm. that can be really problematic. 
in some patients it can be really severe where it affects their ability to um, walk or button up their clothing um, or do things that they love to do, especially if they're interested in artwork or crochet. Oh, or something, mm -hmm. right? I could so see that. if if um, someone's experiencing the peripheral neuropathy, um, they definitely need to tell their doctor because you can do things like a dose reduction or um, hold therapy until their symptoms improve, treat with a different drug if it's that bad. Mm -hmm. um, there's even some vitamin therapy that you can choose to do um, to... Um, B12? D B12 is one of them. Yeah, but, I've heard that. And I haven't talked to you, but I found this new vitamin cocktail. Um, <laughs> I was at a meeting and one of the nurses there talked about her patient who had starred herself on this vitamin cocktail and it really helped with the peripheral neuropathy. Oh, so good. My patients who are struggling with that, I give them this, it's like five different vitamins. And then there's this other thing called scrambler therapy that's done at some centers. I believe it's still experimental, but some of my um, patients um, have had this done. I think it basically involves a TENS unit. But there's re there's really else. a strong need for innovative ideas to try to prevent peripheral neuropathy. Mm -hmm. But in your situation, wasn't problematic. So we went back to treating with the paclitaxel carboplatinum and bevacizumab. And you really, you did well in terms of getting a partial response. I think so, quite a few months I mm -hmm. think it was working. Right, and then we, we did the maintenance of for quite some time too. 